One of the things that we all wrestle with at this point in life is a very important question. And this very important question, and once you really hear the question and it's going to pop on the screen, you'll understand that it's, it's, it's a big deal. The question that our generation is mainly wrestling with is, 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 is an old question, but has become a very fundamental question in our specific time right now. And the question is, who am I? Who am I? It's an identity question. Who am I? This has become one of the most asked questions, specifically now in our generation, where there's so much confusion, mm -hmm. yeah. so many narratives to follow. There's a lot of division in our world right now, different voices with different ideas, different things and concepts and worldviews. And because of all this, the question, who am I, has become a question that we must, as believers, as Christians, Christ followers, this has become a question that we must pay attention to. Right. Some people anchor their identity on a job, a title, a career. Other people find their identity on a number in their bank account. Ooh. Someone say, hey man, hey, make it rain. Yeah. <laughs> others find it on their race, while others find it on their sexuality. Wow. Others, they find it on their relationships. So if I'm friends with this type of person, this builds my identity. If I'm friends with those types of people, this is my... Some people even base their identity on the neighborhood that they live in. Wow. We find our identity in so many things. We are in a desperate moment in our generation where people are thirsty or craving yeah. to anchor their, their identity on something. Yeah. Wow. Right. And this is why this one question, who am I? It's such an important question for us as Christ followers to really ask. Paul, in this letter, Colossians, he has this one expression. And this expression is an expression repeated over and over and over again. And, and the expression that he uses is in Christ. Right. And I believe that he does this because he wants to emphasize that our identity should actually be founded Come on. in Christ. That's right. So Colossians chapter 1, verse 14 says... The son paid for our sins, and in Christ we have forgiveness. Colossians 1.16 says, for in Christ all things were created. And Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 says, in Christ all treasures of wisdom and knowledge are safely kept. In Colossians 2.6 says, so continue to live in Christ. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, he said, all of God lives fully in Christ. And in Colossians 2.7, say it with me, keep your roots deep in Christ. So I think that he's trying to prove a point here. Yeah. Yeah. And the point that he's trying to prove is this, that our identities and everything that revolves around our life and all that we are and all that we think should be in Christ. Your identity should never be founded, like, you know, founded on or found in the external. It should be found in Christ. If we place our identity on something external, like money, status, race, sexuality. Mm -hmm. We become extremely prone to idolatry because we will place that external thing in the place of God. Yeah. Mm. Wow. So if you place your identity on a job title, on a career, if you place your identity on the color of your skin, a group that you belong to, on your sexuality preference, mm -hmm. if, if, if you put it on your position, or the amount of money that you have in your bank account, if, if, if you place your identity and you anchor it on any external thing, what you don't understand is this, that you will be super, super easily prone to idolatry because the truth is this, your source of identity ultimately wow. becomes your Lord and your master. Mm, come on. See, you, you, your source of identity, wherever it is that you place your identity, yeah, it determines your choices, it determines your worldview, it determines where your money goes. Mm -hmm. It'll determine where time goes. It will determine where your energy goes. Yeah. It'll even determine the fights, the, the causes that you will fight for in life. Mm -hmm. And so the question is this, do you notice how all these things should actually be determined by Jesus Christ and not anything else? Wow. Do you notice how these things are things that should be determined by God himself? And the worst part, of this entire dilemma is that when God asks you to let these things go so that you can serve him, his kingdom, his cause, you will forfeit serving 
your true Lord and Savior. Because wow. your identity is wow. attached to the external. Wow. Dang. And you will believe that these things mm -hmm. are you. Wow. <laughs> Dang. So when you place your identity on the external, whatever it is that you place it on, it becomes your Lord and Savior. And it becomes your master. So when your true Lord and Savior, which is Jesus, comes and says, hey, I want you to let these things go, you're going to have a huge tension inside your soul. Yeah. Because you're going to feel like you're wrestling with self and that you have to detach hmm. parts of you, yeah. which is not true. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because none of these things are great sources for your identity to be anchored on. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. This is why we see people who don't have, quote unquote, the time to serve God's vision. They're too busy with what defines them. <laughs> They're too busy with what they define as their identity. This is why you'll see people who don't put a pause to their hobby to spend time with God because their hobby is what defines who they are. Wow. This is why you'll see people who never give financially to expand God's kingdom because what they spend on is what defines them. Mm. Their money defines them. Wow. Hey. And by the way, I just want to say something that we're going to be taking a missionary trip, our wow. first missions trip to Honduras. <laughs> August 2021. Yeah, this is our first missionary trip. And, and do you know why we can make this missionary trip? We can make it because you have been partnering with us for the past couple of years, financially giving faithfully, and you've been generous. Therefore, we can expand God's kingdom and reach people in different parts of the world to get to know who Jesus is. And this is why we're fulfilling the vision that we're going to be a global ministry. Because it takes, it takes Jesus Christ being our Lord and Savior and him saying, hey, I want you to give. See, see, our, our, our source of our identity determines where we give our time, where we give our energy, where we give our, of our finances. And this is why this trip is possible. And just let me tell you a couple of things that we're going to be doing two things on this trip. We have an agenda for this trip. No, th three things, actually. Number one, we're going to go look at the land so that we can actually purchase land to build a building. <laughs> That is super cool. Like, I would have celebrated that right away. Second thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to go train leaders. We're going to be training leaders because we've always believed that we're a church that is going to raise up leaders for Christ. And the third thing that we're going to be doing is we're going to be ministering to the church there. So we're going to be preaching to them. We're going to be leading them in worship. So we're going to have some of our worship, crave worship come with us. And this is all possible because you have made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your heart yes. and not only that but he's become the source of your identity so therefore since money is not your the source of your identity and jesus is when he says give you've given faithfully and because you've given faithfully we're giving to a vision we're giving to a cause which does not belong to us it belongs to our lord and savior now we can expand his kingdom minister and reach souls not just in canada but around the world and let me tell you there are campuses that we're going to start planting in Jesus' name everywhere. Amen. Amen. I'm believing, hey, listen, I'm, I'm not lying to you when I say this. Different parts of Canada, someone say amen. amen. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Amen. We're going to plant in the United States. Amen. It's coming, believe it yes. or not. Yes. See, this is why our identity must not be found wow. in the external, yeah. but in Christ. Yes. Amen. But an interesting dynamic and an effect takes place. Realizing this truth and accepting it can sometimes be very tough. Mm -hmm. And the reason, because most of the times, the external things that we base our identity on are not bad things, yeah. mm -hmm. but good things. Wow. So there's a tension. Because we base our identity on something good. It's not an evil thing. Most of the time, right? Most of the time. Most of the time. God, amen. <laughs> Having money in the bank is not a bad thing. Having a great job or a great career, these are not bad things. These are good things to have. Yeah. Having a big house, having a big lifestyle, I don't think it's bad. Obviously in modesty, of course, right? But the problem is when your identity comes forth from these things, mm -hmm. these external things, yeah. it's not a sin to have them. It's not a sin to build them. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is when these external things become the source of your identity. Wow. Now wow. you're prone to idolatry. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So my title for today is, who do you think you are? <laughs> That's the question. Who do you think that you are? Not in a condescending way, in, 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 in its face value way. Who do you really think you are? Who do you think you are? Yeah. Today we pick up the Colossian letter where Paul tells us that we belong to Christ and in him our identity is found. So Colossians chapter 2 verses 9 to 10 and the NIV says this, for in Christ, I love how it starts with just in Christ, <laughs> yeah. like he carries on, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So this is talking about what we spoke about I think in chapter episode five of season one i believe where jesus was fully god but he was fully man so we're not going to go over that verse 10 and there it is again in christ uh -huh. you have been brought to fullness you have been brought to fullness he's the head over every power and authority wow. so this once again we covered it in earlier episodes in season one that jesus is the one that is in charge of everything and he is supreme over everything mm -hmm. Now, verse 11, we're going to read it in the NLT, says this. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, hmm. but not by a physical procedure. Someone say amen. 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 Actually say thank God. Thank God. <laughs> and then Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. Right. So, something that's very important for you to understand is this. Circumcision was something really important to Israel. Mm -hmm. Circumcision was a big deal. Yeah. It's not a big deal to us. We still practice it, right, in hospitals. You still, when a baby boy is born, they'll actually ask you if you want the child to be circumcised or not. This is something that we still practice. It's more hygienic for the male's uh, anatomy, his, his, his private part. It's more hygienic. It's cleaner. It's, 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 it's a better way to do life. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> And so we still practice it, but they, they, they didn't really necessarily just do it for hygienic reasons. Israel, the Jewish people. This, this was something very important for them. After eight days of birth, every baby boy had to get circumcised. Mm -hmm. Circumcision was a mark to tell the world that we, the Jews, are set apart because we are God's chosen people. Mm -hmm. right. It is our mark that separates us from every other person, every other nation, every other people. Right. Wow. This mark is what defines us as God's chosen people. So that mark defined a lot of things for them when it came to their dynamic between God and the world. Right. They were highly favored. And this is why wow. the topic of circumcision was the first heavily debated conversation in the early church. Wow. This is what Paul had to keep on repeating in his letters. You no longer live by the law, guys. Mm. Yeah. You don't need to be circumcised anymore. And you don't need circumcision because of what Christ did for you on the cross. But the Jewish leaders kept pushing this on the new Christians. And they wanted to keep them based on the law and not on grace. Right. So everywhere that Paul would plant a church, remember that Paul was an apostle that started his ministry after Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again. Yeah. Yeah. When Jesus dies on the cross, everything that had to do with the old covenant, which was the law, was no longer needed. Jesus came to fulfill the law. And so everything that needed to be done, Jesus is like, I'm going to do it for you and I'm only going to do it once and once for me, doing it for you is enough. So he fulfills the law. Now, after Jesus Christ resurrects from the dead, we enter what we call grace, right. where it's no longer based on what we do to get God's approval. It's now based on what Jesus did. Right. So Paul starts his ministry after this old covenant passed and the new one begun. And Paul's taking the gospel to the Gentiles, not Israel, not Jewish people, yeah. everybody else that is not a Jew. Yeah. And he starts planting churches, raising up leaders, and doing all this crazy ministry stuff. And everywhere that he would plant a church, the Judeo-Christians would follow. All the Jews that had become Christians would follow Paul. And he would do this so that they can convince the new baby Christians, the Gentiles, yeah. the new baby Christians, mm -hmm. even the new Jewish Christians, hey, Christ is good, grace is good, but you need a little bit of law. And so they were trying to convince wow. every single person that became a Christian through Jesus Christ and by grace, you must get circumcised. Mm. And if you're not circumcised, like you have Jesus, good, but you need circumcision. Jesus plus circumcision. If, if, if you don't have circumcision, 
So if, if it's Jesus plus no circumcision, you are not saved. Huh. See, see, see that mindset? We carry that mindset too. We just don't call it circumcision. Whoa. We call it performance. Oh, we call it measuring up. Oh. We call it not good enough. Oh, we call it shame. We call it unforgiven. We call it, I'm too dirty. I'm not holy. We call it all these things. The truth is this, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Wow. It's not Jesus plus this. It's not Jesus plus that. It's not Jesus plus performance. It's not Jesus plus moral behavior. Not Jesus plus I'm measuring up. It's not. It's just Jesus. Someone say, just Jesus. Just Jesus. And so Paul had to fight this everywhere. That's why when you read Galatians, he's, he, 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 he says something very interesting. Galatians is the most like raw letter that you'll ever read from Paul. I love Galatians. It's my favorite book. Probably one of my favorite books. He says, who fooled you? Why are you guys being, in some translations, he used the word stupid. Why are you guys being so foolish to start with grace and then end up going back to the law? And so this is why Paul says in verse 11, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised, and, and, and it's quote unquote here, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, which was the cutting away of your Sinful nature. Wow. So circumcision was the literal cutting off of the flesh. So wow. every male uh, penis has a bit of flesh that overlaps it. And some of that flesh is at the tip. Circumcision is cutting that flesh that covers the, the male organ, the head of it. And, and, and it's cutting that little piece of flesh off so it's no longer covered. It's more hygienic this way. So this circumcision that the judeo christians were, were were trying to get people to do was literal it was cutting off of the flesh so imagine you're like a 32 year old guy that comes to christ and it's like you gotta get circumcised Bro. 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 i'd rather stick to uh, my other faith right thank you very much but after christ died so 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 the literal circumcision was cutting off of real flesh but after christ died on the cross it was no longer a physical principle it became a spiritual one. Yeah. This means that when we come to Christ, God cuts off. God cuts the power wow. of our flesh right. yes. off mm -hmm. so that we may have new desires, yeah. which are our truest desires, wow. which is to be in intimacy with Jesus, love Jesus, Amen. and serve Jesus. Yes. These are the desires that we all have deep down inside. See, all of you that are listening, you have desires, but you have deep, truest desires. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your deepest, truest desire is to be in intimacy, in connection with God. Yeah. To serve him so that you can live on purpose. Mm -hmm. Superficial, you know, desires are what we call the desires of the flesh, which is you want to go to the party, you want to get hammered, you want to have sex and all these things. And, and what's funny is that it is enjoyable, but it's temporary pleasure. Yes, mm -hmm. that's true. Because how many of you that are listening that have done all these things came to a place where you wore out that pleasure? Wow. It no longer sufficed. You went to the party, but you felt empty. You kept having sex, but you didn't feel valued. You kept doing the drugs, but you didn't feel fulfilled. You tried to numb yourself with alcohol, but it all came back. And now you're worse because you're caught in an addiction. These are superficial desires. Wow. We call them flesh desires. Wow. Our deepest, truest desires are deeper within our hearts because they're in our spirit too. And our spirit wants to be in connection with God. We want to be loved. And we want to feel loved. And we also want to love and feel like we are loving. Yes. This yes. is something that is true within all of us. That's this is why we're fascinated with love mo movies, love <laughs> stories. Because there's a longing in us to be like, why do you think that we're so fascinated with superhero movies? Why is that whole genre even, why was it even created? Yeah. Because there's a longing in us to be rescued. Yeah. Mm. Wow. Because these are our truest, deepest desires. Right. Wow. And so when God, when we come to Christ, we get a spiritual circumcision, which is Paul's way to put a picture in their heads that when you come to Christ, God cuts the power of your fleshly desires. Wow. And Paul then speaks of these fleshly desires in Galatians chapter 5. And I'm going to read a couple of verses above before he lists them so that I can give you context. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 to 21 says this. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives that you won't 
be doing what your sinful nature craves. Wow. We have a crave. Yeah. And this is why our church is called Crave Church. <laughs> and our vision statement yes. is, what is our vision statement? We create a space of grace for imperfect, imperfect people. people yeah, because we all naturally crave. Uh -huh. yes. mm -hmm. Amen. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. Uh -huh. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. So he says, these two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the spirit, God's Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. This is grace. With grace, we have the Holy Spirit that empowers us. Without grace, it was the law, your own efforts. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. And here are the results. Here are the desires, the superficial desires, the desires of the flesh that we all wrestle with, that some of you have worn out already because they no longer satisfy. They are sexual immorality, mm. wow. impurity, mm. Mm -hmm. lustful pleasures, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. idolatry, sorcery. Mm -hmm. Sorcery is going crazy, like witchcraft. Yeah. Sorcery, the occult, going crazy on TikTok. Mm -hmm. All of you that are following all that, in the name of Jesus, put that down. Come yes. on, amen. Amen. Hostility. Some people are just super hostile, man. Mm -hmm. They're just super angry. Yep. Just hostile towards everything. Yeah. They just want to fight everybody. <laughs> sure. Quarreling. Yeah, they see. They just want to fight. Jealousy. Some people are very jealous. Outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division. Envy, drunkenness, oh, and look, wild parties. And other sins like these. So these are the superficial, the things that we desire, that we think are going to fulfill us, but they never do. Let me tell you again, as I have before, Paul says, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so this is what you see people, and this is what you sometimes see yourself naturally gravitate towards. Mm. How many of you naturally gravitate to more than one thing on this list? Mm. Some of you naturally gravitate towards sorcery. You like dark stuff. You like watching dark things. You like witchcraft. You like the occult. You like magic. You like, and I get that because when I was a kid, I was drawn to that naturally. That's, that's, that's a flesh desire. Others of you naturally, you're prone to gravitate towards anything that has to do with lust and sexuality. Others of you are prone to like the wild parties. Like you are such a party animal. These are things that we naturally gravitate. These are our flesh's desire, but not our deepest desires. And the way for us to live our truest and deepest desires happens when Christ circumcises our heart. The cutting of the flesh's power to live in our new identity found in Christ. That's when these desires are put to bed. When you really come to Christ and Christ really, like you have a genuine, authentic salvation experience. Mm -hmm. And Jesus cuts off the power of the flesh. Wow. And now your deepest desires begin to surface. Yes. Wow. Your deepest desires are like, I, I got to make it to church. I got to make it to church online. I got to get that word. Come on. I need that word. I need to be there on time. I need to, I'm, I'm in love with what God is saying to me. I'm in love with what God is doing through our church in this season. I'm in love with what he's doing for our community, for our city, for our country, for Honduras, for around the world. I'm hungry. Right? This is, this is, this is when you like, oh man, I feel like I need to go pray or I feel like I need to like, let go of all the garbage that I'm listening to on Spotify. <laughs> And I, need, and I need some worship that will draw me. See, the, the, these are the desires coming up. These are your truest desires because yeah. Christ has circumcised your heart. This speaks to the transformation that only God can give. Mm -hmm. wow. This is a transformation so many people try to perform through their own efforts. Wow. They try to perform it through their own strength or their own will. But only God can transform a heart. Have you noticed that so often times people try to live a good and holy life and it's just a matter of time before they revert to their old ways? Yeah, that's because they haven't given up their own strength. Therefore, God can't operate. Have you noticed that? Some people try to walk out the Christian life. They try to live a holy life, a good life, a moral life, a Christian life. But then just as 
it's just a matter of time before they just like give up and they revert back to their old sinful desires and their old sinful ways. Why is that? You want to know why? Because they never started with grace. Mm. Wow. Wow. They started with behavior. Ooh, that's so good. Or if I can say it better, they started with performance. Mm. When you start with performance, or when you start with behavior modification, you do not allow God to operate in your heart. Wow. Some of you have not experienced a real authentic transformation because mm -hmm. you keep trying it, and you keep trying to do it yourself. Wow. Wow. And God's going to let you keep on trying mm -hmm. until you get tired. And finally, give up and surrender to him. It's true. So, good. Mm -hmm. yeah. so if you're tired, let me tell you, you're tired because you've been fighting your transformation mm -hmm. with your own strength. Mm -hmm. And this is a message from the Holy Spirit to you saying, my son, my daughter, stop trying to do only what I can do. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Give up. Surrender to him. Just give up. Just lift your hands. But I surrender. I give up. Amazing. And I'm going to let you have your way in my life. And you wait on him. Wait on the Lord. Hey, hey, come on. Hey. When our hearts become circumcised, we end up belonging to Christ. Our identity is found in him and not external things. Read this on the screen. Our identity is no longer found in what we do or what we have. Mm -hmm. What we do or what we have. Uh -huh. My identity is not Pastor Marlon, the leader of, of Crave Church. Uh -huh. My identity is not a motivational speaker either. Uh -huh. my, my identity is not a leader that builds leaders. My identity is not a good looking young man. <laughs> Come on. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> My identity is none of those things. Because all these things are external. They're good things too. See what I mean? That sometimes we have a conflict because sometimes we base our identity on good things. Yeah. And God's like, I don't care if it's good. If it's not God, it's not good enough. Wow. See, for me, I can build my identity on this church mm -hmm. as a leader of this church. And it's a good thing. This church is a good thing. It's a holy thing even. Mm -hmm. But it's not God. And the trouble is this, what happens when the good thing is removed? So goes our identity. This is why you cannot build your identity on external things. Amen. Now, this next part is the center of this entire message. I love this next part. It says, verse 12, for you were buried with Christ. Oof, 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 oof. Get ready. Get ready for this part. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. So I want to tell you something. And I pray that you capture this, all of you. If you've been zoned out, this is the one part where I want you to zone in. <laughs> When we get baptized, we're dead to sin. Right. We die to sin. Meaning, all the bad things that we've done in life, every bad thought that you still have not thought, every bad word that you still have not said, every evil deed action that you will do and have not done yet, and every mistake that you've committed and will commit that you have not committed yet, all of that died on the cross when Jesus was crucified. Wow. Right. Wow. All of it. Wow. All of it. Amen. Every bad word, Come every on. bad deed, Come on. every yes. mistake. Yes. Wow. Yes. Every single thing yes. that you have not even done yet 
died the moment that Christ died on the cross. All of the bad that exists in your life, it all died on the cross with Christ. And because we're buried with Christ in baptism, we're now made alive in Christ so that we could live a new type of life, a better life. One that is condemnation free, one that is shame free, one that is guilt free, one that is rejection free, one that is regret free. I don't know if you've been living in regret lately, but I want to tell you if there's something that you've regretted because you made a mistake or you made a bad choice in the past, I want to tell you here tonight that that bad mistake, that bad choice died on the cross more than 2,000 years ago when Jesus Christ was crucified and rose from the dead. It died and it was buried. You no longer have to live in regret. Now we live a life that is full of forgiveness, full of his mercies, full of grace, and full of love. I'm not perfect, but I'm covered. Being buried with Christ isn't speaking to your efforts in being good. It actually speaks to what Christ's sacrifice accomplished for you. That all of your mistakes, all of your slip-ups, all of your imperfections died on a cross the day that Jesus was crucified. Yeah. Wow. Since that day, all of your sin and all of your shame was dead to God. Wow. So when is it going to be dead to you? Wow. Come on. Wow. Christ buried it. Come on. Come on. It, it, it died. Come on. God's not looking at your mistakes. Wow. God's not looking at at your imperfections anymore. God's not looking at your slip-ups. God, even the future ones, God's not looking at them. He's not paying attention to them. They all died. The day Jesus Christ died, they died. If you made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, you are not perfect, but you are covered. You're covered. So in other words, Paul is saying, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. Verse 14 is just lit. He says, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. No hater, no critic can say, ha, gotcha. Because if you're saved and covered by the blood, you're forgiven. And let me pause right here when it comes to the critics and your haters. It's funny when they say stupid things like, ha, gotcha. Nah, man, you don't got me. What you got is your sin. <laughs> because the same people that criticize are the same people that live in a human body mm -hmm. just like ours. Yes. <laughs> yes, right. We're all flesh. Uh -huh. We're all imperfect wow. in the need of a savior. I don't care how holy people may appear to be. Wow. And this goes for me too. Don't you ever place your eyes on me. Yes. Don't you ever place your faith on a leader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Come on. Because we're flesh yeah. just like you, yes. we're in need of grace, just like you. We're in need of forgiveness, yes. just yes. like you. Yes. We're in need of the blood, just like you. Yes. We're in need of mercy, yes. just like you. Yes. We need God's love, forgiveness, grace, and compassion, yes. just like you. Amen. We're all equal. Yeah. Amen. So next time someone says, well, look what you did. Mm -hmm. Be like, Let's look at your laptop history <laughs> to see what you did. Because <laughs> the truth is that at the end of the day, we're all imperfect people. That's true. So to me, it's insane that people don't want this. This is such a crazy deal for us. It only favors us. 
We get the better end of the deal, which makes me think, why wouldn't people want Jesus and his grace? It's insane and absurd not to want what he has to offer us. His offer is crazy. It's 1,000%. It's 1,000%. We 1,000% get the better end of the deal. We take his perfection and his grace, love, forgiveness, and he takes our sins, mistakes, and slip-ups. We take his life. He takes our death. Wow. Why wouldn't we want to give our life for this type of God? Hmm? So my conclusion is this. You can play piano. To me and to so many Christians around the world who have understood this truth, this revelation, this gospel message, this is the reason why we've built our identity in Christ and not on the external. This is why. I was asked, you know, who is Marlon Medina? And I told them what I told you earlier. I'm not a pastor, not a motivational speaker, not a leader of leaders, although I do all these things. But at the end of the day, when you strip Marlon Medina off of all his responsibilities, his talents, his everything, what you'll get is just a servant that serves Christ. Amen. That's all. I'm just a servant servant that lives from the words well done good and faithful yes. servant Amen. that's all I am at the end of the day when we choose to find our identity in Christ and not in a political party or race your sexuality your bank account or a title yeah. yeah whenever that's taken away from you you won't crumble because your identity is based on something bigger that's right. yes. something better Jesus the rock that never fails. Right. He is my solid ground. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. In him, my identity is found. Thank that rhymed. Lord. That was good. Jesus. There's a famous song that is titled, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Thank it was about a man that lived in a third world country, I believe, and they were Christians were being persecuted. So they went around all the villages saying, deny Christ or die. So they came up to him and his family. They took him out and uh, they put them on their knees, I'm guessing, hands up on their head, They're like with a gun, you know, deny Christ and live, deny Christ and live or die. They threatened not to take his job or his title. They threatened not to take his money or his friends. They threatened to take his life. But even his life was not his own, nor his identity. Wow. To live for him was Christ. Wow. That's why in the moment that his life was being threatened to be taken away, he sang, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. What is your identity? founded on who do you think you are my identity is on Christ yes. I no longer live but Christ is who lives in me Amen. for me to die is gain those were the words of the Apostle Paul he had died to self he didn't place his identity on a political party a religious group his, the color of his skin his nationality his sexuality None of these things. Or how much money he had. No. His identity was on Christ because he was grateful for what Christ had accomplished for him. That even though he had not repented yet, Christ chose to die for him That's right. anyway. Wow. 